Hello and welcome to the Comlex Instant Review. Today we're going to be reviewing osteopathic considerations in gastrointestinal tract. The sympathetic innervation to the GI tract mainly comes between T5 and L2, so remember that. On board exams, the most common divisions are generally going to be T5 to T9. That's going to be supplying the greater splanchnic nerve to the stomach, duodenum, liver, pancreas, and to the celiac ganglion. So T5 to T9, you're going to be thinking about, you know, gastric cancer, ulcers, uh, hepatitis, pancreatitis. Uh, remember the celiac ganglion and the greater splanchnic nerve. If a patient comes to you and complains of um, colitis or um, small intestinal disease, you're looking at T10 to T11. Typically patients with diarrhea, uh, constipation, these types of symptoms can be localized to T10 to T11 through the lesser splanchnic nerve um, and those supply the superior mesenteric ganglion. T12 is via the least splanchnic nerve to the left colon to the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So patient who presents with say diverticulitis, okay, you're thinking about T12 and remember the associated ganglion and the splanchnic nerves as well. For L1 to L2 via the lumbar splanchnic nerve uh, to the left colon to the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So L1 to L2 is the lumbar splanchnic nerve and um, it supplies the left colon to the inferior mesenteric ganglion. The parasympathetic innervation to the GI tract comes from cranial nerves 10, vagus nerve, and the S2 to 4 via the pelvic splanchnic nerves. And this is most commonly divided as follows for the board exam. Cranial nerves 10, which is the vagus, goes to all of the GI tract down to the proximal two-third of the transverse colon. Okay, so the tr proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon um, and all of the GI tract above it is supplied to by the cranial nerve 10, vagus nerve. The sacral S2 to S4 is via the pe pelvic splanchnic nerves from the distal one-third of the transverse colon to the rectum and the anus. So it's important to know the differentiation here. If you have a patient who presents with uh, rectal bleeding or rectal cancer, anything like that, you're thinking S2 to S4. Also the distal one-third of the transverse colon is also S2 to S4 for parasympathetics. Now what effect does sympathetic tone have when it's increased on the gastrointestinal tract? Well it causes a vasoconstriction and increased thickening of the mucosal secretions with increased number of goblet cells. There's increased fluid retention, smooth muscle lumen relaxation, the sphincters actually contract, um, secretion and motility decreases, there's decreased buffering of stomach acids and increased gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis in the liver. The parasympathetic tone um, when increased results in thinning of the mucosal secretions, um, increased amount of secretions, smooth muscle lumen contracture, um, sphincters relax and there is secretion and motility which increases and there's increased stomach acid production. So um, these you know effects on the sympathetic and parasympathetic are important to understand from a clinical perspective um, because they can help you understand what autonomics you're going to treat or diagnose. What happens if a patient comes to you and they have impaired lymph flow and venous drainage? How can this be caused? Well, decreased drainage and removal of waste products, any sort of an increased congestion, uh, depressed immune action and increased susceptibility to infection are all causes of impaired lymph flow. Now in all of the previously mentioned GI problems, the common theme here is maintaining a balance between the neurophysiological uh, and the autonomic system. And so if you keep that in mind, it's going to help you, um, you know, answer a lot of questions on the board exam. Also keep in mind that um, 
regarding the GI symptoms, the identifying factors, uh, you should look for somatic dysfunctions in the cranium, that is OA and AA as well. And also the rib cage and the upper lumbar region, especially the sympathetics there. And if you do a full analysis, you'll get a lot of information. Um, you also should consider the diaphragms, the superior thoracic aperture, which is the thoracic outlet, and um, the diaphragm plays an important role. And also the mesenteries, as their important influences on the nerve, um, artery veins, and lymphatics, and to the GI tract. So keep all these factors in mind as you're looking at the problem or looking at the patient when trying to determine the pathology. Type 1 Friet's law, as we mentioned, is for group curves like scoliosis. There's opposite coupling of side bending and rotation. And generally, um, you know, if there is an increase in scoliosis, then there will be significant uh, gastrointestinal influence. So there's a relationship between the scoliosis and an increased uh, gastrointestinal influence. For type 2 Friet's, remember that individual intersegmental dysfunction with non-neutral and same coupling of side bending rotation is present and the board exam questions will often point to the dysfunction here so they may say T8 you know is flexed uh, right and rotated right and the rotation in the side bending uh, will be to the right which helps you determine it to be a liver related issue so um, knowing the exact direction, whether it's right or left, helps you localize the organ. And that's mainly through the Chapman's reflexes. The liver's on the right, the stomach is on the left. And that's important to know. The spleen is on the left, and the pancreas is on the right. Additionally, the midline of the sternum corresponds with the pylorus, and the iliotibial band um, is represented near the thighs. So. The iliotibial band also has several important Chapman's points. Keep in mind that posteriorly clustered around the transverse process are posterior Chapman's points from T5 to L3 and also trigger points uh, which are areas of tenderness that radiate symptoms elsewhere indicating somatic, somatic and viscerosomatic reflexes. These are not commonly associated with uh, GI disorders on the boards, but it's important to understand their purpose. Finally, before we end, I'd like to talk about the various um, osteopathic considerations that you should look into. You want to make sure that you normalize the basic mechanical strain patterns, whether it's the sacral, lumbar, thoracic, rib cage, cervical, or cranial regions, as you're looking at the board exam questions. Start with that and then normalize the sympathetic tone either through an inhibition technique or through a Chapman's point treatment. And finally, normalize the parasympathetics and then look at the lymphatics. Our next podcast will go into detail in each of these treatments um, for the GI tract. Visit comlexflashcards.com and good luck in your preparation for the boards.